Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about DevOps. So let's get into it. So the question in question was posted on a video I made called Why do DevOps engineers make more than software engineers? Um, and I should have seen this one coming, I suppose. The immediate question first first question is how do I get how do I get to become a DevOps engineer? That is an excellent question. Um, I will go as far as to say that I don't think there is a single person today that would qualify for all the roles or the range of roles that a DevOps engineer can be responsible for. Because one part of it is, of course, that the industry doesn't know how to define a DevOps engineer. Um, and the fact of the matter is that that ambiguity is very similar to the same sort of definition problem we have with quite a lot of roles uh, where if you go to two companies they will have a very different opinion on what your responsibilities and knowledge requirements are uh, depending on where you go. There is a core to the thing and that's what we're going to talk about uh, that is very good. I would say the, these are the bare bone basics at the very least uh, but I want you to understand that becoming a DevOps engineer uh, the range of possible things that you could do or have to do is it's enormous. Uh, it's like in front end to claim that you are. I mean, nobody in front end knows everything about front end. It's impossible. There's so much. And DevOps is very much the same thing. So, the bare bone basics will be that first and foremost, you need a cloud certification. Uh, you don't need to have per se the certification, but if you're going to swing that you are a DevOps engineer, you're basically putting yourself in a position because this is what, the problem with these sorts of hybrid roles. You may think that the definition is one thing, but I can promise you that your employers can feel very differently about that. If you can tell me in an accurate way where the line between a DevOps engineer and an ops person is, I will tip my hat to you because most people have no idea what the difference is and most people like they they're treated as interchangeable things. Uh, the difference is that traditionally the ops person had a different type of work role whereas the devops engineer is basically yeah, you're basic in essence you become you you you're almost not in all companies but you're almost expected to be 50% a coder 50% uh, operations person and to be an effective operations person you need to know the cloud today that's all that's what it is all about uh, you of course have on-prem solutions and hybrid clouds and all this good stuff but at the end of the day the most companies are moving towards the cloud so getting a cloud certification is actually it's a very good investment for you uh, as I said you don't have to necessarily have the certification but if you're gonna sell that you know this stuff a certification is going to help a lot when it comes to uh, to cloud solutions. It's very similar to the security industry where, I mean, as a software developer, you don't really have to have like a certification in a language like say Java or C Sharp or whatever you're using, right? People are just going to do a code test to check things out. But the cloud, just as with security, it's so enormous and there's so little knowledge outside of that community about like what you test to make sure that somebody knows it that the certification actually helps your case when you want to sell that you are a DevOps engineer or a, uh, a white hat hacker like a pen tester or something like that. So certification number one. Uh, second thing is going to be programming, basic programming skills because that's like the dev in DevOps. Uh, how much coding you need to know and so forth it varies a lot good investments for a cloud um, uh, like a DevOps engineer if you if you don't know anything about software development at all I highly suggest that you either start with Python or you start with JavaScript the reason is because Python is basically sh I mean unless you are going to be very specific to say Azure you're gonna do primarily things that are .NET related uh, 
it's actually very simple for you to just start with Python because it ships with all, basically all the Linux distros at this point. I don't know if there are any that are shipping without it. Um, and when it comes to JavaScript, uh, a lot of the stuff you are going to do in the dev area because this is where the ambiguity starts. There are tons of it internal tools and tons of re situations where knowledge of JavaScript is a requirement or it's a very handy thing to have. Uh, and the good sort of thing about it is that there is probably nothing you could possibly want to do. And I will go as far as to say that this is actually a strong, in my opinion, I would go, if I were to do this, I would go with JavaScript over Python. Uh, simply because, yes, Python is simpler or beginner friendlier, if you know, in a sense. And sure, there's this nice thing that, yeah, it ships with, I mean, to me, that's like a nothing argument, but some people feel that that is important because for some reason we cannot possibly install the node runtime. I don't know why. But uh, the uh, when it comes to JavaScript, there is nothing that you could possibly bet on that is more diverse than JavaScript if you're talking about nothing. If, you, if we just exclude these obvious things like low-level stuff and so forth. If we're just talking utility and being able to do everything from websites to your own CLI tools to scripts, whatever you might want to do, JavaScript is the gold standard uh, and the best part about it is that you actually have a lot of return on investment on that because there's a lot of stuff that is JavaScript oriented that's not in comparison. Python has nothing on JavaScript. If we talk about like diversity in terms of usage and capabilities and stuff like that. Python is a great language, as I said, like, so pick one or the other, but my overall suggestion would be uh, to look at JavaScript first. Uh, and then learning Git, version control, things like that. Uh, there's a very big movement called Infrastructure as Code right now, which is very much based on like everything is something something code, uh, documentation as code, uh, infrastructure as code, etc. etc. And the reason being that people are now just realizing that uh, Git and version controlling uh, and so forth is a very effective, like outside of the developer community. It is a very effective, if not in my opinion, the most effective way to manage change control uh, over time. Because the problem with having hosted solutions where you just do edits in place as opposed to having a more of a, like a versioning system, which is what Git is about, uh, is that it's very hard for you to roll back and it's hard for you to track changes over time and so forth. And Git already has a very nice ecosystem of services like GitHub, Bitbucket, uh, Azure um, repositories, whatever you might have, right? Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you're doing, like all these configurations and stuff uh, that is related to the infrastructure of your systems, uh, it's really good to have that in a very secure location with multiple versions and things like that and be able to like basically create pull requests and things like that to a repository somewhere and that requires git knowledge or mercurial mercurial if you want to do that but git is probably the best choice there and then finally comes the most ambiguous po point, which is all the tools, because uh, these are just the basics. And then you have everything from Jenkins, GitLab, Travis, Terraform, Argo, Doc uh, Docker, Kubernetes, Chef, uh, Puppet, Salt, uh, am I forgetting someone? Uh, Ansible, of course. Uh, uh, you have logging systems like Sentry, you have uh, metric systems like, I, there's, guys, there are so many things. I, I can uh, I mean, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to tell you all about them. And this is why I tell people, just go to the job postings and check your region. What are the most common platforms that they are using in your specific region and then read up on them. The thing that is nice though is that this problem is the same problem that most developers like application developers have where you kind of you realize that in the beginning there's like all these options like there's so much of it that you cannot possibly learn all of it. So the same thing to do in that situation is to focus on one stack, focus on something that seems to be the most common thing, learn that really really well and then when you know that really well everything else is going to actually become become very simple for you in comparison because and as an example um, let's say that you only work with docker well then learning docker compose or learning how to work with uh, kubernetes is going to be easier because you already know docker it's the same thing with programming languages or if you know jenkins it's probably a fair assumption to say that Azure DevOps or maybe GitLab or some other CI or CD solution is going to feel fairly intuitive to you, even if it's not exactly the same thing, right? Uh, so uh, 
that's why you have to basically pick something that seems to be fairly stable in your region and go with that. So what I want you to take away from this is that in order for you to become a DevOps engineer, you kind of have to realize that it's uh, it's an enormous, enormous field. It's probably, I would say that being a, f a, like a holistically good DevOps engineer is, if not more complicated, on the same level at least as being a very senior front-end developer, where the knowledge range of what you have to know is absolutely enormous. The potential, uh, if we talk about like all the things, if you wanted to claim that you are good at all the things related to DevOps or front-end, uh, you will have to spend many, many years. Uh, working before you can swing that uh, because um, the thing about front-end that people forget is that uh, there's quite a lot of concepts in front-end like not just the libraries everything from font loading to you know CSS to different the web standards uh, web vitals performance benchmarking and all like all this sort of stuff that is related to the front-end sphere and trust me the DevOps engineers they have just as much to look at if not maybe even more in some cases. So start by learning the basics and the basics are usually get the cloud certification. Doesn't matter which one you pick, you can go with Amazon, GCP, Azure, pick whatever is popular in your region, get that certification because it's going the reason why that is fairly important is to because it gives you credibility uh, that you know the cloud solutions and it also like a lot of the cloud stuff is very much related to product knowledge uh, apart from, you know, network administrating and things of that nature uh, and then learn pro basic programming at the very least uh, ideally JavaScript or Python they are going to be very good choices but it, at the end of the day it's not so important you can go with Ruby or C sharp or whatever uh, I recommend JavaScript because it's going to set you up for a lot of convenience further down further down the line uh, then you need to learn version control git uh, or mercurial git is probably the better choice uh, and then finally, you're going to have to look at the job postings in your region to figure out what tools and solutions do they want in your region. Because being a DevOps engineer is a lot, a lot of it is related to delivery pipelines, knowing how to set up infrastructure and all these services that the application developers and like their teams are using, and then maintaining those. Uh, so that's that's at the very least the basics. And trust me when I say this, guys. This is not an easy thing to do. It will take time. But getting to a junior level, you should be able to swing that in about the same amount of time as a standard software developer gets to be as junior as a software developer. Have a great day.